Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Affinity's webinar series. I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the Gadigal of the Inora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land. And as we are webinar series, I also acknowledge those in other traditional lands throughout Australia. On behalf of the attendees today, I pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and all descendants who have cared for this place, this land, over the, the 65,000 years. Further, we honour the Aboriginal, those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who are joining us today. My name is Dr. Cathy Hare. I'm at UTS, the University of Technology, Sydney, where I work as a senior lecturer. And I work in the teaching and learning area, an area that is very stimulating and, and connected. But what inspires me most is the work of Affinity Intercultural Foundation in building bridges across our diverse society through dialogue and friendship. I'm proud to be a member of the advisory, Affinity's advisory board. But before we start tonight with the webinar, let's take a glimpse of what Affinity has done in 2020 and we capture the highlights. I think as the leader of a government with the United States is the US featuring Muslim and Christians that enhance social cohesion. Peace operations and peace building provide hope to areas that are emerging from conflict. What, what are the factors that contribute? We're trying to solve common problems. Talk about a Human Rights Act, we tend to. Must be preserved. For those who have never attended an Affinity event before. Affinity was formed um, some 20 years ago by a group of young Muslim Australians to promote multiculturalism and foster intercultural and interfaith dialogue by building bridges between different groups in society. So the warnings have been in since 1988. It's science. will help build the resilience of our environment to climate change. Vulnerable parties need a court system that's flexible, accessible and adequately resourced. And if we don't um, uh, save each other and work together to save creation, then it'll all be destroyed. Looking at activating positive peace is generally community level. To help make sure that every person that doesn't have a voice in this equation, imams and other um, religious and faith leaders, get access to the key services that are available to them. Generally looked upon to give advice and support. Even if we doubled the humanitarian intake in Australia, to all speak up about the deterioration of human rights. In the world at the moment, you see... There's still so many displaced. Where leadership is strong and you see where leadership's not strong and you look at the difference it makes on society. There's a realisation that the place for youth... Uh, what is impacting on decreasing... And it is a privileged space. Peacefulness uh, uh, globally uh, is, is at a church. Still a very good opportunity for you to grow as a person. Uh, and use that positive peace framing to think about what you can do. There is no space for hate. There is no space for bigotry. There is no space for racism. You are wonderful citizens which are contributing to the well-being of our state. I in your only community. And the example you are setting. Be in your own family unit. Make sure that all of us stay safe and we keep our loved ones safe. Or see what you can do personally. You're an example to the rest of the world about what multiculturalism means and how we can all be successful. I have a responsibility to them. This is the most uh, extraordinary public health challenge. As well as to everyone else, not just to my family. That we have faced in a hundred years. Um, economic, social and cultural rights are also very important. Especially this year, it's really an opportunity where we're all in the same storm. We might be in different boats. These conversations are so important to promote the concept of togetherness, cross-cultural collaboration and of breaking down barriers that might otherwise, but should never exist. Really putting yourself out there in the university spaces that we can't use ethnicity or race. And utilising the online spaces that are provided for you. Or religion as anchor points to be able to divide us. Positive peace is an indication of, of a, a, a capacity of a country uh, to be peaceful. Well, there is an economic need for why we need to have a CEO who is Indian or Chinese. There's only limited time in the day to be able to study and balance other things. 
But there is a moral case of saying, why not? Um, crucial for your professional development. And actually, that's a really good point. 100% a contributing factor to the success. And just being more respectful of each other would avoid a lot of these problems. We're yet to see culturally diverse representation at senior levels. wonderful, wonderful set of events. So all the uh, episodes are available to watch on any time on the Affinity's YouTube page. Tonight's webinar is, uh, episode is proudly presented in collaboration with the Whitlam Institute within Western Sydney University and the Centre of Social Justice and Inclusion at my own university, University of Technology, Sydney. Without further ado, I would now like to introduce you to tonight's facilitator, Philippa McDonald. Philippa is a former senior ABC news reporter and senior journalist, and is one of Australia's highly respected financial journalists and presenters. Currently, Philippa is an author, MC and facilitator, mentor and media trainer. Renowned for asking insightful questions and fostering quality discussions, Philippa has facilita facilitated events on COVID and bushfire, bushfire recovery, interviewing New South Wales Chief Psychiatrist, new, new, um, Senior Public Health Officers, Cabinet min Ministers and Multicultural Leaders as well as facilitating many of the Affinity webinars. Welcome Philippa. Thank you Cathy for a very warm introduction. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I join you, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and of course, the traditional lands from where you're watching today. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders of the Aboriginal community and extend my recognition to their ancestors, descendants and leaders past, present and emerging. It's a pleasure to be here virtually hosting Affinity's webinar. Tonight we'll focus on the role of education in achieving social justice outcomes for the community. Does education help shape the individual and does it have a broader social impact? Ask just some of the questions that will be explored. I'd like to introduce our speakers, the Honourable Verity Firth, and Professor James Avenarkas before we dive into the discussion. Verity Firth is the Executive Director of Social Justice at the newly established Centre for Social Justice Inclusion at the University of Technology, Sydney. She's currently spearheading the university's social impact framework, a first of its kind in the Australian university sector. Ms Firth has experience at the highest levels of government, not-for-profit and education sectors in Australia. As New South Wales Minister for Women, she implemented sector-wide strategies to improve women's recruitment and development. As Minister for Education and Training, she focused on equity in education and as CEO of the Public Education Foundation, the foundation became a major provider of support to public education. Professor James Avanatakis is the Pro Vice Chancellor, Engagement and Advancement at Western Sydney University. He's also a lecturer in the humanities and a member of Western Sydney University's Institute for Cultural and, and Society, having spent 12 months at the University of Wyoming as the Millwood L. Simpson Fulbright Fellow. Prior to entering academia, James worked with human rights and social justice organisations across Asia, the Pacific, Europe and Australia. Welcome Verity and James. Could I ask you both to just give us your thoughts on World Social Justice Day in the context of Australia? Who'd like to go first? How about you Verity? <laughs> well I um, thank you for that. My, um, my opening remarks were going to refer particularly to how um, education leads to social justice on this day where we um, celebrate social justice. And I thought I would just tell the story about when I was first um, Minister for Education. Many people said to me, 
you're going to love this portfolio because it's the portfolio of, of hope. And I think it's a really lovely way to describe education, particularly from a government, government point of view. So much that you do in government is often about fixing up problems once they've already occurred. You know, that's a generalisation, but, you know, ambulance service, police service, they're all dealing with problems that have already occurred. But education is the portfolio of hope. It has the capacity to change life and change them in a really, really real sense. And as I suppose, you know, in modern capitalism, there aren't a lot of levers that government has anymore that it can really pull, which actually allows it to, to change someone's demographic destiny. So at the heart of what social justice is, it's about equality, right? It's about equality and fairness. That's what it is for me. And so for me, having equal access to high quality education for all is a fundamental of a socially just society. And that's why I wanted to pay tribute on World Social Justice Day to education. Thank you. Over to you, James. <laughs> thanks, Philippa, and thanks, Verity, for, for that opening. Fantastic. Um, look, I, you touched a little bit on my background, which was uh, my background in, in, uh, in, in social justice and human rights organisations. Before that, I actually worked in banking and finance, and I went from banking and finance into human rights. And I, it was while I was working in uh, some conflict and post-conflict zones that I actually decided to become a, 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 an educator. And that is because what I saw was that education was the most powerful tool for social justice there was. The way that it can change and alter people's lives, but communities, but the way it can reshape communities as well, because education isn't just about the individual, it's about what that can actually bring a, a bunch of wealth and knowledge and, and, and to the community. And I think in a, in a, in, in a, you know, for us as educators, I think that is the power of education, the way that it can actually play a role in inclusion, can bring people in, I think it, the way it can help us uh, build uh, stronger citizens, be citizens that, that have a sort of an ethical framework. And also, and I think it, most importantly, or one of the most important dimensions when we talk about social justice, is that social justice is a community thing. And one of the things that education can do, and we really need to make sure it does, is that it actually uh, arms us to have complex and difficult conversations. Because not everybody's gonna agree with us, but social justice, for one group of people only doesn't count. It needs to be inclusive. And so education, actually, the, the third dimension I think really important is this idea to actually create, uh, I suppose, you know, help us shape people's ability to have complex, nuanced conversations and actually find ways to confront challenges, even with those we don't agree with. Well, let's hope this will be a complex and nuanced <laughs> conversation. And thank you so much for that. Look, let's start with you, Verity. Does social justice contribute to social cohesion, specifically within the field of education? If so, how? So, absolutely. And I'll tell you why social justice contributes to social cohesion. And I've even got evidence to back it up. Um, firstly, if we go from the point that social justice is essentially about fairness, equality and human rights. So that's our definition of social justice. What the research shows us is where there are greater inequalities, you have less social cohesion. And the reason you have less social cohesion is they talk about the establishment of interpersonal trust, your relationship with others. Now, interpersonal trust is created by a sense of equality equality of opportunity, equality of access, equality of resources. That is often how interpersonal trust is built in a society. And of course, interpersonal trust is absolutely critical to cohesion. And all, there's all sorts of research that shows that the more equal a society is, specifically around issues around economic justice or economic equality, but also around all the other myriad of human rights issues around racial equality and gender equality, the more equal a society is, the more cohesive it is. So the, there is research that tells us that. But when you think about it, it's also common sense. I mean, just think about how you yourself feel. If you feel like 
you don't have an equal say or that you're not going to get that job because of who you are, not because of your skills, or that your kids aren't going to be admitted to that university because of who they are, then of course you're not going to be feeling particularly socially cohesive. You're definitely not going to be particularly um, supportive of the society that's doing this to you. And you're either going to turn extremely apathetic and completely sort of refuse to engage at all, or you are going to engage it often justifiably with a whole lot of anger. Now, I hope we're not, you know, Australia isn't perfect. We're a little bit better than other countries in a lot of this stuff. But if you're looking at the developed world, and James will know a lot about this because I know he's just been there, there is no better example than the sort of tensions that now exist in the United States. That real sense, for the first time in their history, there is now evidence that the next generation will be less well off than the current generation. And it's this insecurity, this um, sense of unfairness, for want of a better word, which is driving all sorts of reactions on both the left and the right, and of course, less social cohesion. So, well, if we're talking about the United States, but if we go back to Horace Mann, a pioneer of American public schools in the 19th century, he famously called education the great equaliser. Uh, you're saying it is, but maybe in the United States it's not. <laughs> Does education in Australia help to deliver social justice? Yes, it does. Um, it really does. It is still the great equaliser in a lot of ways. So education in Australia does provide um, an individual pathway for people to better themselves, no doubt about it. But what James was saying earlier is also very true. If you actually want education to be the great equaliser, then you've got to do more than just use education to improve individuals' life circumstances, although that's very important too. Education must also be a part of improving society. And that means, as James says, teaching young people more than just this is how you pass an exam, but actually teaching them to think critically and be able to look at their own society and contribute to their own society in a positive way, but also using our brains and education to drive better social outcomes, whether it be public health, for example, or a range of very, very valuable research that is driven by the education system. Social justice is about both the individual and the collective. And that's why education always has to have that dual focus when it thinks about itself. Well, James, you're at university. Um, are we looking at, oh, so are you, Verity, at UTS. <laughs> but if you look at kids when they, young people, when they leave the public or the education system, uh, you know, primary, secondary school, and they come to Western Sydney Uni or UTS, um, is there that sense that uh, that they've got social justice in mind, that they're aware of everything that stands for and that they see that it is sustainable uh, for them? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. And I think one of the things that we, we need to remember is that people go on different journeys, yeah? And so not everyone's going to cut. We, we, we do get a significant section of the students who'll come to the university and they'll say, oh, we want to get involved in social justice, different social justice projects. Uh, might be you know, driven by, say, environmental justice. It might be driven around issues of, of you know, responding to sort of, um, you, know, uh, you know, inequalities and so on. And there's others who are, who are really have their own personal journey and they may be more focused on their own professional and personal development more their own community or, or, or family needs and you know and I think about my own journey you know I spent I came to uni as a first member of my family and really the university for me was a, a university education was a pathway to economic security and so I went through that pathway that was my folks at the time and and but what the university did was it gave me the tools that as I progressed through that process of, um, of economic security is it also gave me an ethical framework to realize that actually I can have all the economic security from a personal perspective but if I'm living in a, in a nation that uh, where people are feeling like they're getting left behind or are being left behind that um, economic security is only on a surface level it, I can only protect I suppose I could only build a fortress around me and it's not going to give me the quality of life I want. So I think um, it's, you know, it, it might, you know, for, for, for when I look at my my students in a classroom, they're all at very different pathways on that on that social justice journey. 
But what I what I always think to myself is not everybody um, is going to be you know come from school enter the enter the university and want to do things um, in, in a sense of social justice they're going to have their own professional personal developments in mind and so one of our roles is to say okay well if that's your priority in the short term or that's your priority to get that security that's great but while you're doing that also think about these things build that framework think of the things that you not just what you want to achieve but what you want your society to look like and never let that go and so, you know, it, it really is this sort of complex journey that we need to assist, uh, you know, to, to work with our students on. And I should just wind back the clock a moment. Are there enough Jameses uh, first in family going to university? I mean, we do hear <laughs> about this widening gap. Are they making it or have we gone a little backwards? Uh, look, I mean, I can only speak of, I suppose, you know, some of the, the, the data I know at Western Sydney. And we have seen, I mean, we do get somewhere between, uh, very, obviously varies year by year, but we usually get somewhere between 50 and 60% of the students that come along are first in family. And I think, you know, look, when, when I went to uni, um, there was one way in, and that was the HSC result. That was it. That was all you did. You sat for your exam, you did well, you passed, you got in, you didn't, you had to go somewhere else. This is one of the great things things about universities um, these days is that, you know, we have so many pathways in, we have so many uh, ways that you can, you know, you can, and, and, and for some students, they shouldn't come to, to uni directly after school. They should be confident to go off and do other things. Um, and then, or uh, you know, some people want to pursue a, a different career. Some of the best students I have in, I've had in my classes um, have been former tradies. They've gone off and they've worked for 10 years in tra the trades, and then they've wanted to do, do that. Other students I've had, They've gone off and helped raise families, you know, um, uh, say mums who have, you know, who have sent their kids off to school and then coming back into the, looking for the way to get back into the workforce and come along. And that, that is that is fantastic to, to see that. And I think what we really have seen uh, amongst uh, the university cohort is a, a real diversity. And it's not only a sort of a cultural diversity, but a, a class diversity, but a diversity of, of life experiences. And I think that's been, you know, that's what I think has been really great about widening uh, the widening participation um, pathway. And I, now I will say Western Sydney, and like, I, you know, like a lot of universities has, has a college pathway, that is for those who don't get the ATAR. And about, about two years ago, I remember someone graduating, she didn't get the marks to get into uni, so she went through the college pathway, used that to get into uni, used that to get into medicine, got into medicine and then completed a PhD in medicine, right? Now, that that person, that person's empathy level, when they go out and they do their work as a doctor or as a researcher, you think about that pathway, how, how, how much richer as a society are we for having that person go through a pathway that, that 20 years ago may have been closed to them? And do you think it would have been closed 20 years ago because, you know, we've got fees and, you know, everything? Um, and 30 years ago, I suppose, 35 years ago, you didn't have fees. So, you know, don't fees make a difference to young people uh, being able to get a higher education? Yeah, look, I, I think they do. And I think we're going to, I think it's actually, for me, from my understanding and from the, the research and from the work that we've done, it's mostly upfront fees that act as that barrier. I think the idea of, I mean, I personally had to repay HEX and I had, I had no problem with that because I was earning an income that I otherwise wouldn't have earned. And I was more than happy to pay a tax to go back into a system that would help fund universities. What we don't want to see is is, is fees that are, are, are so um, uh, exclusionary or they're upfront that actually prevent people from being able to enter. I think some sort of um, HEC system or some sort of system where people get sort of uh, cheap loans and only have to pay back a fraction of the price, like like we have here, is so much, it, you know, it still allows that, that that sense of inclusion. We don't want to get to the US where people, you know, where people leave their degree with, a, you know, with, with a, a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand $150,000 debt. I mean, that is actually quite, uh, that's paralyzing for, for a lot of people and never be able to, to uh, pursue the career that they want as a result. Having said that, fees are increasing for a number of courses. Yeah, and this is uh, 
Yeah, and look, and I mean, I I will say that the you know the the latest sort of focus on trying to manipulate fees uh, to focus on more of the sciences, I I believe that is a short term solution to a more complex uh, problem, uh, and I think you know the, the I think uh, anything that sees us undermine the humanities or not encourage people to undertake programs in the humanities is actually negative for our society because at the essence about uh, of uh, of, uh, of the humanities is this idea to engage critical thinking, thinking about what the, the sort of the, 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 the foundations of our civilization is. And, you know, one without the other, you know, for me, one without the other it does just never make sense. And I'd like to see much more humanities in the sciences and much more sciences in the humanities. I think those two things just fit so well. And it's, a, it's only a modern construct that we've actually separated them in the way that we have. Verity, would you like to add anything there? Oh, look, I think that's exactly right. I think that those, those critical thinking skills are what every single, not that we're talking about just what employers want, but every single employer says they want students with creativity and critical thinking skills. What is the best degree to deliver that? An arts degree? <laughs> what has the government boosted up money to pay but arts degrees it doesn't actually make sense even in terms of what industry is telling us they want people to be able to do but that's all right um i agree with james i think that the real um barrier to entry to higher education is upfront fees and i don't expect the hex changes to arts to make a huge difference on on who studies arts well, look, we might go back to uh, early childhood now. And uh, many researchers talk about the importance of the first 1,000 days of life, spanning from conception to the child's uh, first birthday. Actually, it's not the child's first birthday, is it? It's the child's <laughs> third? third birth Third, third birthday. Third yeah, birthday. Yeah. Oh. Um, now, this period is considered critical for the foundations of optimum health and growth and neurodevelopment across the lifespan. What role does education play in this very early stage of life? So I um, love this question because part of the um, sort of, not, it's not really a debate because of course there is no education, like, money for education should not be seen just as a pie. But often you get people debating, if there is limited resources, where should we be putting our education resources? And you get this sort of almost argument happening about, is it better to put it at the front end or load it at the teenage end? I have a very interesting friend who works with teenagers who says, don't you take all the money for early childhood because there's still enormous <laughs> opportunities for, the, for teenagers in terms of their neural development and the opportunities to work with them. So my answer to that actually is we shouldn't be restricting the pie for education. It's so important. But the reason why I wanted to talk about that early childhood piece is that probably the most interesting impact that education has in early childhood is actually about the role education plays for parents. So. Mm -hmm particularly for mothers, right? So in, in both developed and developing countries, in developing countries, it's particularly significant. So the facts, and I've got them written up here, so sorry that I'm reading them that way, but for- Thanks to get the numbers right. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's estimated that an additional year of schooling for women, for a thousand women, helps prevent two maternal deaths a year. More importantly, a child born to a mother who can read is 50% more likely to survive past the age of five than a child born to a mother who can't read. And all the way through child vaccination rights, rates in Indonesia, child vaccination rates are only 19% where a mother has no education, but the figure increases to 68% when a mother does have education. So. It's sexist to say, but it's particularly about the mothers when you, and it doesn't even have to be that vaccination in particular, isn't even about university education or anything. That's just about women or girls getting to a first year of secondary education. And it has that sort of impact on the health of their child. Those women are more likely to access health services. They're more likely to be engaged in general, right? Even in, in all that we're discussing. And that's particularly the case even more so in developed countries. So 
the fact that education has such an impact on those incredibly important first years of life, I think is something that we often forget. And again, I suppose we talk all the time about the education of children, but education should never stop. All of those programs where we are reaching out to parents, childhood education programs, getting people in for the, um, you know, the nurses clinic that they run. My school has a schools as community centre sort of community hub and all the mums go there in, um, in the lead up to their childbirth and so forth. All of that stuff is important. It, it makes a real impact and you don't need to stop learning once you hit 18. No. Yeah, I, I have to I have to just agree with that, Philip. I think it's really important that we recognise that uh, that development in the early uh, in the early years. And yeah, we've done a lot of research in this. Um, a development in the early years is a, a big function about also picking up vocabulary and hearing parents talking and things like that. And and that's where education also plays a, a really important uh, role. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the more vocabulary uh, young uh, yeah, children are, are exposed to, then the more they're open to, to learning as well is a really important one. But the second thing about that, and, and this plays right into the point that Verity makes, is the is is how uh, an uh, educated person can be more civically engaged. They can read the information that you know about the vaccines. They are more likely to, to be able to connect with with public health notices. More able to connect with their child while their child is learning. So there's a, there is this there is this. Um, it's it's a it's an important uh, connection there that we shouldn't that we shouldn't forget and and that's why I think the education doesn't just start here and end there it's it's an it begins very young and it just goes on and we should never mm. ever forget that. Yes, I have this one. Yes. Oh, sorry. I was just going to. James reminded me of something, which was this wonderful young woman who I met when I was at the Public Education Foundation, who'd come from Afghanistan, and her family had. Um, fled Afghanistan. They'd been in a detention centre in Woomera, I think, when they first arrived, and they eventually ended up in southwestern Sydney. Anyway, she started her first day of schooling ever in year seven at a southwestern Sydney high school with like 800 kids. She'd never been in formal education before then, but she did know how to read and she did know how to write and she was literate and everything. And the reason she was literate was that her mum taught her. And so within five years, she had actually done so well at school that she ended up going off to Western Sydney. another one of your success stories, James. She went off to Western Sydney. But if it hadn't been for the education of her mother, who'd actually taught her to read and write, I mean, you know, where would she be? So I just love that because it just shows how much that matters. Yes, yeah, so I've got this wonderful memory too of going to this beautiful early childhood centre at Sejuna, which had been purpose built with wonderful sensory gardens, gorgeous classrooms. Uh, there'd been a big investment, but the investment was only going to come to fruition if the mums and dads came every morning and then they would spend the morning with their kids taking part in the classes and uh, it really was something to behold. But that was how they were gauging the success. It was the involvement of a lot of teenage mums and it was also an indicator that they had some research going on that uh, the greater the involvement of these teenage mums, uh, the less likely they were to have a pregnancy uh, within a year or two afterwards. So it had some knock-on effects for uh, just how sustainable those families were and poverty indicators as well. So, mm. oh, mm. well, uh, well, I think we're going to the schooling system there and I'd love your thoughts. How does the Australian schooling system either contribute, and we've covered this, but I think we, I just think we need to get a bit specific, contribute to social justice, out, justice outcomes or how does it hinder? And there must be stories from both sides of the fence there. Yes, and so I'll begin my answer by saying, um, of course, our schooling system, there are just everyday magnificent stories of fantastic things happening in schools across Australia. So all of this is said with love and respect in my heart. Um, where I think the Australian education system falls down, and this is something that successive governments over many years have tried to tackle and it still has not been solved, is that compared to other OECD countries, we have real concentrations of disadvantage 
and real concentrations of advantage in our schools. So we have one of the most segregated schooling systems in the OECD. Um, that is due to many, many reasons, including the funding arrangements with government and the way that we fund on government schools and everything. There's, I could talk forever on that, but whatever the reason, we have a very segregated schooling system. And what's interesting about that is that when you look at any of the overseas data, if you look at OECD and various papers, they always talk about the equity impact of segregation, because what is absolutely shown to be true is if you have a whole lot of advantaged kids in one school and a whole lot of economically disadvantaged or in other ways disadvantaged schools in another school, those kids in that disadvantaged cohort will not do as well as they would if they were in a cohort with mix. So mixed cohorts are incredibly important and there's all sorts of research that shows that this is true. We don't have that in Australia. And I think it is one of the biggest problems we face and I'll tell you a reason why I think it's a particular problem. And it's hopefully something we can rectify a bit if, if by the time they get to university. But what they tell us, okay, we're talking about social cohesion. One of the things that has been, it's again, it's a Harvard study that talks about how do you actually teach anti-racism? How do you stop young people from being racist? And they came up with this um, evidence that showed that you needed two essential factors. You needed diversity of cohort in the classroom. So you actually, you actually needed a whole lot of people in the classroom from a whole lot of different backgrounds, right? And that was because people actually had to get to know each other. They said they actually talked about the university bar effect. They were talking about universities. Actually hanging out at the bar with a whole lot of people from different backgrounds, different religions was a really good thing and you needed it. But that alone did not stop people being racist. Just actually hanging out with people or socialising with people isn't enough. At the same time, there also needs to be explicit instruction. There needs to be actual learning about structural racism, about, you know, in Australia, about Indigenous ownership of the land, about the actual history that enables inequality to exist. Now, again, that alone isn't enough. So if you just have a theoretical model about structure, you know, how racism is terrible, but no one mixes with anyone from any other races, that doesn't work either. It's the, it's the magic of the two. It's knowing people from other backgrounds and liking them and also being able to understand the context that they're in. And that is the critical key to social cohesion. And our schooling system doesn't at the moment allow it enough. It doesn't allow it in some places, in some lucky comprehensive high schools, there's a good mix, but not enough. There really is too much segregation in the schooling system. And, and that is something that we will, um, that'll be a problem for Australia in the longer term if we don't get on top of it. Well then, James, what about universities? Um, and I know you both work at universities, uh, but mm. are universities uh, committed to increasing access for low SES communities? To higher education and what does it involve? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think all universities have made massive bounds in this area, and I think it's been it's been one of the really positive stories of our sector in the last, say, you know, two decades, when you know, really a, a widening participation mission has really driven. Um, you know, when I went to uni. Uh, and I'll, I'll admit the year, 1986 was my first year at university. <laughs> you know, I involved, I arrived uh, first in family. I had, I was like a fish out of water. I had no idea what to expect. Um, I, you know, I, I, I tell the story of, um, of, you know, actually taking my passport to uni the first day because mum, that's what mum told me to take because that was, that was, that was my proof of who I was, that they would let me in. Um, and, you know, mum had never been to uni. She ironed for a living, you know, and dad carried bricks for a living. And so, um, but today, you know, like we look at a whole bunch of programs that are, you know, I, I mean, I could talk about the ones that we run, Fast Foot Forward, uh, Fast Forward, First Foot Forward, Pathways to Dreaming, that a lot of universities do. And it's about actually getting young people from all backgrounds onto the university from when they're young and bringing their parents along as well, just echoing what Verity said, getting them on campus, getting them comfortable, getting them buddies getting them to sort of be part of that and i think that's incredibly important now i think the other thing that's 
I think been really important in the last um, in the last so two decades as well, probably in the last decade more so, is that a lot of the equity-based universities, those universities that have focused on um, on equity, have also focused, have really begun to focus on research excellence. And this is important because one of the one of the uh, unique things about the university higher education sector, and this is where I resist the idea of having research only and teaching only universities. What makes a university a university is the ability to create and apply knowledge, right? And if you're only applying knowledge, what's the point? If you're only creating knowledge without application, I think that's also half the story. So I, the really good thing now is universities such as Western Sydney, which maybe 10 years ago weren't you know, weren't considered world class, or you know, 15 years ago, weren't considered world class. Universities such as Charles Sturt may not have had that reputation either. Now, you know, we have a medical school with medical students that are, are world class, medical research facilities, partnering with Charles Sturt to also produce medical students and undertake that research. And so, I think um, that what we've also seen is, you know, universities that the a group of eight universities expanding, having equity programs, and also uh, other universities, uh, the non-group of eight, really having excellence programs. And I think that 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 combination of excellence and equity is what makes a difference in someone's life. They're not just coming to uni. They're not you're not just giving them a university of second choice. What you're doing is no matter what university you go for uh, go to in Australia, it, excellence is expected. And so I think that they're the twin things that we need to keep on pursuing, not to separate equity from excellence. So those two things overlap. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, that means when you do have someone entering sort of from an equity pathway that you know that um that they're not expect they're not going well i'm here i can just you know p's equals degrees that we always emphasize doesn't matter what how doesn't matter what your background is we expect excellence and we're going to help you get there and we've built the programs and the pathways to encourage that excellence well give us an example of how you you foster that accessible and inclusive learning if you could yeah, sure. Um, look, I, I mentioned some of the programs. Uh, the, um, the 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 fast forward program is one program, and it's a, a program that uh, targets specifically Year Ten students. Uh, and it also is. Uh, we also have information evenings with their parents uh, to get them along, and we we do a whole bunch of things that we. It's about getting the students on campus, uh, exposing them to the different disciplines, uh, talk about life uh, as a as you know um, life on university, and then also. Also, you know, helping them, you know, creating study smart material to help them prepare for, for the HSC, um, help um, run all these sessions on campus as well as online to help them uh, succeed as they go through the HSC. And then when they come to university, making sure that we have the right support structures. Uh, we call it we call it Western success. So you know, it's it's getting someone into uni is only part of the way. Making sure that they stay. Uh, making sure that you know we keep we keep them from falling off. You know, I think about when I went to uni, I failed. Um, you know, I failed five of my first eight subjects. You know, when I my, in my first year, and one of the things that I thought was, I remember f the first thing that I failed was only worth like five percent. And I remember thinking at that time, oh, if I fail five percent, if I fail this this exam or this quiz, I'm done. And so I just dropped out of the subject. I just sort of stopped turning up because I thought if I fail this one quiz, I'm done, because I didn't have that 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 social capital to know that it was only a fraction. And so today, it's about it's about creating, um, uh, you know curriculum that's more inclusive. It's about creating the support structures, and it's also about um, you know creating those. Those, uh, I suppose, those processes where you reach out to people, um, no matter how they're how they're going, and sort of offering the, the support that you need. And you know, and I, I talk about, I could obviously talk about Western Sydney, but you know, I know the work that happens at UTS and and you know, colleagues at you know the University of Newcastle, you know, all doing really amazing stuff that um, that that is there to not only bring good students in, uh, but also make sure that um, that the support structures are there for them to stay. Well then, can I ask you how do you promote social justice outcomes when there's systemic uh, discrimination in the lives of, uh, uh, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look. Um, it's a. It's a. Uh, we, this is a conversation we're having today uh, with uh, with a, a, a colleague at the university who's involved in in making sure that um, that. Uh, 
that you know that keeps the t really focused on the retention of, of our Aboriginal our First Nation students. Look, I think there's a there's a there's a obviously that's a, a really complex answer to that, but but I think there are there are there are three really important things that we need to think about. One is ensuring that those students have um, the the right support structures to to be to if they do confront any discrimination that they know where to go. Oops, am I there or have I frozen? I don't. You're frozen, but we can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, so yeah, so the right support structures um, and the right empowerment to work with them to for those to have that and having institutes such as the the, um, the Badenami Centre at Western, um, the um, Jambana Centre at, at UTS, and so yep, on are, are really important, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the second one is to actually make sure that the university is brave enough to look at itself and see where it's failing. Right, and that is that's the hardest part. Is you know, and I, I I remember you know when the black the Black Lives Matter protests were happening in the U.S. and there's a lot of emotional support for the protesters there. One of the one of the things that I kept on saying was, well, you know, we we need to take this opportunity to look in the mirror and see where we're failing, um, where we're failing, uh, you know, Indigenous peoples in this country. And I think um, universities, I, th I think, have been quite um have gotten better at actually acknowledging where they're failing you know our, our failure and retention our, our uh, not having um not having uh you know enough say aboriginal staff on campus and recognize the fact that we need to to improve our employment rates and so on and the third thing i think is you know and i read this really great article um in the New York Times the other day, you know, probably about three weeks ago, and it was called uh, "Do We Expect Do We Expect Too Much from Our Black Heroes?" And and, and that is, you know, when 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 we do get those First Nations staff in there, not expecting them to solve all the problems, to kind of saying that they're yeah. just the next piece of the puzzle um, to to help to to help solve those problems. And I think you know that's and and so we also need to understand that that putting too much pressure on that staff is also a, a form of systemic racism, that we expect this yes. one person without the right support <laughs> structures, without without the critical mass to sort of say, okay, we've now solved you know, 200 years of colonialism exclusion, I'm gonna do that by teaching sociology 101. You know, like it's such a, it's such a, a mistake that universities I think have made historically. And so I think there are three really important things that we need to, to really push hard on and, and uh, and 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 uh, and accept the fact that it's a long-term strategy. And one of the things that you know we spoke about today, um, and I'll, I'll finish on this point. One of the things I spoke about today was saying, you know, I shouldn't be poaching someone from UTS to meet my you to my to meet my you know my, my aim of having three percent First Nations, you know, Aboriginal. We shouldn't be poaching someone from UTS or UCD. Um, yeah, sure. If there's a, a promotion opportunity for that person to come. That's great, but what we should be doing is growing our own. Is making sure that our students have pathways into the university to become lecturers, to to lead the way, uh, to to sort of grow the cohort, not sort of just shift chairs and say, "Oh, we'll take, we'll, yeah. you know, let's 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 take that person," and then and and that's a zero sum game. Yes, it's well, interesting. We what, had the um. Sorry, I was just going to yes, sorry. sorry I, um, I was just going to add to James's point because I think his idea about that poaching and growing your own is really important and it's interesting that universities um because our center for social justice and inclusion looks after our widening participation programs at uts and we openly talk to other universities about sharing like we shouldn't be just going in to one poor school in southwestern sydney and all competing for the 30 best kids to try to get them to come to university we should all be going in with the uh, with the objective of raising aspirations for all of the students we encounter to come to university um raising the boat for all rather than just all competing with each other or around students but i do actually think the collaboration between universities on that stuff now is a lot better mm. Mm. now well you know to overcome racism um diverse groups of students need to interact it's it's the elephant in the room and um, doesn't this demand that we sustain face-to-face -face teaching of tutorials because teaching, you know, during a pandemic has gone very much online, but it was going very much that way anyway. I mean, I must Who'd admit, like to run with that? have a view on this. <laughs> um, I feel extremely sorry for the poor first years of 2020 
university students who really were in a solely online environment. And what I think we're worried about now is it's almost like we've trained up a cohort who are now almost comfortable at being online, right? Um, mm. And I know that there is some tension around that. Like we've suddenly got students saying to us, oh, well, I think I might just do it online because it's easier than coming to UTS from Marrickville, which of course is about 15 minutes away. Um, but we have surveyed our students and the overwhelming majority do actually want to return to some sort of campus life. Um, and yes. so what we're doing, I don't know what Western Sydney is doing, but we really are doing everything we can to encourage return to campus. We're being quite strict about the masks. So in every face-to-face -face class, everyone's going to be wearing a mask. But our view was it's better to have them all there in person with the inconvenience of wearing a mask than continuing to have this quasi you know, hybrid system, which as anyone who's worked in education knows, it's partly the conversations that occur outside the tutorial that is the sparking of real learning. Like I think about what I ended up becoming a politician, but most of my learning about politics wasn't in my government one lecture. It was in the labor <laughs> club or in the talking late into the night about, you know, socialism or something. So re reconnecting students to each other is a big part of what university is about as well. Yeah, James, Look, so think... what's happening at your uni? <laughs> yeah, look, I think um, I, I, we're, we're also having this process of trying to get students back on campus. Um, and I think it's, it's, it is important because I think most students, and I agree with Verity, uh, most students um, do want to, come on, want to come to campus and do want to have that experience and do want to sit in their cafe and, and you know, and, and chat to people about all sorts of all sorts of crazy stuff which um uh, uh you know in, including the, the insanity of going into politics verity I, I don't know how you ever did it you know but uh but um but i think i mean i think the other thing to, to think about is that um there is a there is an issue around the importance of having some online access you know uh I know from some of the students that we teach at Western um, in, in my own time, uh, we always, you know, one of the things I always try to make sure is for those students who couldn't get on campus, for those, you know, for those students that were mums that had kids at home uh, unwell, for those students that, you know, maybe, you know, had to had to work, had like a, a four o'clock shift and a three, you know, and a two o'clock lecture, you don't want them driving across Sydney traffic to try and get to work on time. Um, uh, so, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really, um, uh, it's it's really important that we offer um, you know those those different opportunities to learn. Um, I'm a big fan of face to face, but I also know I've also been contacted by students that essentially have said um, uh, you know that have said have said to me, oh, you know, having online appropriate online access is is important. And so I, I think it, there is a balance in there. There is a balance that we need to try and find. And look, you know, at this time, you know. There's various forms of community engagement, academic mentoring programs, and and you know really mixing young people up. To what extent is that possible? Um, go, Verity. You're about to say something. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I um, are you saying that to what extent is that possible in the COVID thing? Because I do think yeah, it's really or, difficult. Or, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's one well, layer that. Yeah, so during COVID, we did... Because mentoring is a great tool, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. So, well, it's interesting. If you're looking at something like mentoring, we run all sorts of formal mentoring programs at ETS, right, where we um, match our students up with industry mentors and academic mentors and also literally you can't escape university without at one stage being offered a mentor. Um, but the, casual, the more sort of casual mentorship, the mentorship that happens i suppose mm. through the personal interaction that's what's harder to create in a covid like environment i mean i mm. must admit what covid has also taught me is the actual really important role that clubs and societies at universities play right like you know james was talking about not everyone wants to go off and go on peace rallies or something a lot of kids just want to come and join a soccer club or join a 
Harry Potter, we have a Quidditch team. And even that is a really important part of mixing and getting to know people. And again, if we're talking about different types of people from different backgrounds and religions and ethnicities, Quidditch or soccer actually helps bring all those different types yeah. of people together. And I think it's it's those things that have been lost in COVID and are just extremely hard to replicate on in an online environment. Yeah, it's now, so look, true. I, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to wrap Sorry, up uh, shortly, but I have got a question <laughs> from uh, the people participating tonight. And I think this is really for you, James, because you made that fascinating uh, point about excellence and equity. Um, uh, would you, everyone's been having such a top, a, a, a tough time uh, with COVID and that must be uh, hindering some people's progression to higher education. But would you, along with other factors, would you suggest it would be compromised to facilitate more students if you were to sort of compromise on that academic excellence um, or, you know, maintaining academic standards? Yeah, look, I. I think, you know, you don't, there's things you'd never compromise on, you know, but you also need to recognise the fact that, um, you know, things like the school that you go to helps shape the HSC mark or the ATAR mark you're going to get. We know there's a, a correlation between the resources that a school has and the ATAR that a student is going to get. So the question then becomes, how do you, what, what's the role then of, do we just accept someone dependent on their, on this one number, or do we take a more holistic and complex look at the person? So someone comes to us and says, oh, look, I got a, I got this ATAR, you know, three years ago, and it's not much good, but I really want to study, you know, I want to study nursing. And you're like, okay, well, look, on and, and, and for the last three years, I've been doing this. Now, do you sit there and say, no, nah, you're done, you're gone, you didn't get the ATAR, or do you put them through, say, maybe a college program, and, uh, you know, get them to do a certificate, and then let them build those skills, and then monitor their, their, their process progress and then sort of say, okay, well, you've made that progress, you've got this experience, let's look at the, let's look at the complexity that you have. Um, and so I think it's important that, that when we talk about excellence, we don't only look at excellence from one single dimension. Okay. Um, you know, it's a, it's a much more, it's a, it's a, it's a much more nuanced way of un understanding it. If we only fall down and only look at people based on their ATAR and only say that is excellent, then I think we'll, begin to look at only one dimension of more complex individuals. Um, so, you know, that does it, if someone is not prepared, if someone is not prepared for, for entering a university, that is a different matter. But simply ATAR is not the only thing that prepares you mm -hmm. for, univer for university. And, you know, and now, I'll look, just, sorry. Yeah. Yes, no. Finish your point. I, I, just, I, I just going to say, you know, and I, I've seen, you know, and again, I, I mean, I look at my own example, uh, you know, from my own personal perspective, you know, I sort of kind of sucked at school and snuck into uni by about, you know, like literally snuck into uni. Like if I'd got anything less, I wouldn't have got in, you know, and it took me a good, you know, it took me a good 12 years to find my feet um, in the professional workforce uh, to find the things that I love doing and then really pursue. And then I pursued a, uh, um, some, some graduate work. And you know, ended up topping the class, but that was that was my pathway. And I think one of the things you don't want to do is is exclude people on on one dimensional issues. Now, look, hundred uh, percent. On agree. another note, yeah, uh, universities uh, have are seen uh, in many quarters to be education businesses, and the uh, over the past couple of decades, we've seen an increasing reliance by universities on um, foreign students, international students. So uh, one of the big pipelines was from China. The relationship has been very fraught. We've got the pandemic. Um, what kind of a future would you see for both your universities and uh, given loss of revenue uh, loss mm. of academic staff, loss of admin staff, huge job losses, um, uh, and adapting to fewer full fee paying overseas students. It's a difficult one, isn't it? It's um, 
I mean, I think that Australian society, and by that I also mean the government, need to have a think about what they want from universities because it is true to say that for the last 10 to 20 years, the Australian higher education sector has been funded, not predominantly, but a big chunk of the funding has come from overseas students. And there's all sorts of ramifications of this. It's led to um, increased focus on global rankings. I mean, there's all sorts of both good and bad impacts of this focus. But the point is, universities are extremely reliant on that money. And that has let government off the hook. Like it's meant that government has not been funding universities the way they used to. I once saw this amazing statistic that I'll probably get it wrong, but it was something like in the early 90s um, at UTS, and I'll definitely get this wrong, but it was like 80% was coming from the federal government and now it's 25%. Universities are no longer even majority funded by the government. Now, that is a big call for the government to have made, even if it's made it by little bits by little bits year after year. I think that we should have a world-class publicly funded education system that both enables mass participation, which, you know, as we were talking about earlier, is helped funded through HEX, but essentially is about giving people access to a world-class education, and that the, the government backs as one of its key industries. I don't think the government thinks that at the moment. And it's fundamental because if if international students collapse overnight, that will be a big, big problem for Australian higher education. If we don't get it back after COVID, I don't know. What do you think, James? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, there's, I, I agree with what you say, Verity. I really do. Um, there's a couple of things to add. One is that I, I think having international students here uh, has been tremendous not just financially but as a soft as a really important form of soft power for australia and i think the fact that we have this globally recognized education system that really works to educate um folk i think is really really important and i think it's something that goes beyond the income generated in fact, I think the income generated should be secondary. You know, I mean, we look at we look mm. at the, the the tensions within the world at the moment. You know, we really should be seeing our education system. You know, I mean, yeah, sure. Let's let's say that education. You know, if you're if you're, you, it can be an income generator and so on. But I think more importantly, it should really be about bringing communities together. You know, one of the things that I'm really proud of with Western um, is that we have a really significant. Uh, you know, 30 or 40, I could be wrong, PhD students from Indonesia, you know, and Indonesia is one of our most significant strategic, political, security partners, you know, I mean, how important is that relationship? Like that relationship is so fundamentally important. So I think the, the problem isn't international students. The problem is the way that they, if they're only treated as cash cows. And, you know, and I don't blame universities for this. Universities, as Veris indicated, we were given a business model and that business model was go out and bring international students. And we've been very successful at it. And then you get criticised for being too successful at it. That makes you financially vulnerable. And, yeah, you know, and I think I think we do need to make sure that we, we get we get the balance right. But I also think that we need to recognise the additional value that international students present to, to us and the opportunity that they give to our students, the alumni networks that are built, the businesses mm -hmm. that are opened up there that actually then attract our students, the, the, you know, the, 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 inter, the exchange, all those things are so valuable for the richness of our society and are important you know, economically, strategically, culturally, politically, all those things that we need to, to, to be reminded of. Well, look, thank you very much, James and Verity, for an illuminating conversation. And to conclude, I'd like to call upon the Whitlam Institute's director, Leanne Smith, to present the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Wow, what a fantastic panel. Um, first, let me say thank you to the Affinity team for pulling off, as usual, a wonderful event. Um, thanks to Dr. Kathy Hare, to Philippa, that was amazing work getting all those questions in. And of course, to James and Verity, it's always been my pleasure and privilege to work with both of you around issues of 
um, education as empowerment and, and how we can do better at educating informed and empowered citizens in this country. Um, I just thought quickly I might go back to the theme for this year's um, UN World Day of Social Justice. Um, and it kind of came up in when Verity was talking about um, the challenges of online teaching in the, co in the context of COVID. So the theme for this year, um, uh, the UN's theme is actually about the digital divide and how we take care of issues of social justice in the context of this brave new world that we face mm. and how many uh, people are getting left behind. And I just w wanted to point out two things for people who are interested in that topic. Firstly, I know that the Young and Resilient Research Centre at Western Sydney Uni is doing a brilliant project at the moment on youth diversity and wellbeing in the digital age. And that um, ties very nicely, I think, with um, the work that Human Rights Commissioner Ed Santo has been doing on um, his digital rights consultation. And I think that's due to come out um, this year. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in um, social justice in, in that space, in, in terms of digital divide, they're both things to, to keep an eye out for. I thought just to finish off by um, echoing what Verity said kind of right at the outset, which is that social justice for her is about fairness, equality and human rights. And I think it's uh, important for all of us to remember that those concepts are, are very, very precious and rare and, and things that we're all, always going to have to keep fighting for. So I'm very glad to hear from these eminent persons about how they're doing that. And I encourage you all to, to join in and, and do the same. So thank you, everyone, and good night.